I'm a principal software engineer with the AWS Elemental. I've been with AWS Elemental for over six years, and I've been working on video compression for uh, the last 18 years. I mainly focus on uh, video quality, any video compression algorithms out there, and my job is to make picture look good. I spend my day looking at video in a silent form, always on mute, and I know every person on CrowdRun uh, probably by nickname. That's great. <laughs> I love it. Ramsey, welcome to Inside the Videoverse. Um, you know, only a true Kodak engineer can say that I watch video eight hours a day with no audio. <laughs> People say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Must be such a boring job. <laughs> oh, the interesting wow. part is you catch yourself at night after work watching a uh, video without audio. And that is uh, that is wonderful. Like You cannot <laughs> try to uh, read on the lips, I, I guess. Um, it's, a, it's our tray. In, uh, any video compression will, will, will have this. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Well, that's great. Well, uh, really, really uh, awesome to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on. And, you know, uh, when we were discussing what to talk about, I think immediately you said, let's talk about AI, machine learning. Uh, and it's, of course, a super hot topic uh, in any industry <laughs> now, but especially in video compression. Uh, so, you know, let's start just with a general, um, you know, maybe a general, almost like a, an explanation. One of the things I do find is that, you know, we just had NAB, for example, and you walk down the, the aisles uh, on the show floor and there isn't a booth, regardless of what they sell or what they do, that doesn't have AI or ML or, you know, something um, uh, related to that. Uh, as a as a feature uh, of their product, so I I think a good place to start is you know what is the difference when you hear uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, you know, define it for us in the context of video compression. Um, sounds good. I think I will start by AI because um, that's the broader term. And AI in in general and definition may, might vary um, is a, is a term used to classify that machines that try to mimic human behavior, mimic be, meaning learning uh, or simulating uh, any human uh, task. So AI is like uh, the the umbrella term for uh, for anything that machine will take over uh, uh, and uh, do any human uh, task. Under the uh, AI, there is the machine learning. And machine learning is a subset of AI. And what machine learning does is we try to learn from past data. And it uses massive data. It uses uh, training, it uses learning. And the objective is to predict the future or to, or to make this to make decision. A smaller subset in inside the machine learning is deep learning, and um, machine learning has been around for decades. It's not something new. What is new is deep learning, and deep learning is uh, tightly coupled with the idea of neural networks. So, with the advent of neural networks and the um, the, the AlexNet in two thousand twelve, uh, the uh, where it it did show a great uh, achievement by uh, neural, uh, neural networks. Now, deep, no, uh, deep neural networks are the um, kind of the hype of the moment. So people try to or, uh, use the words deep learning, machine learning, uh, AI interchangeably. I think um, we are we are in, in machine learning phase. I think mm -hmm. AI is probably uh, far out, couple of decades, but this is uh, this is like uh, I think this is we are in the era of uh, machine learning. Yeah, 
You know, there's a, a lot of really great scientific and academic work being done, especially in the area of video compression and um, uh, with machine learning, deep learning, you know, AI, as you've outlined. Um, there is no silver bullet. You know, I think you actually said there is no free lunch. Um, <laughs> so. I would love, you know, for us to spend some time talking about how, um, let's start here. How does one separate, I'll, I'll call it the hype from the reality, but, but, but what I really mean by hype is like the academic research, you know, um, which is a little bit hype because often it really can't be deployed commercially. Uh, for any number of reasons, you know, it can just be, it requires way too much compute than is feasible. Maybe the bang for the buck is actually not there. So, you know, for what it costs, you know, to actually execute the algorithms, there's other ways, other more efficient ways to get there, even though it may be less sexy. Um, but let's start there. You know, what, what do you think about when you when you look at this and separating kind of that hype from the reality of what can be used in commercial use. I think you hit the quant quite essential point in uh, video compression and machine learning and the hype around uh, machine learning. The, what video, I'll focus my, uh, my answer on video compression because, um, Audio is different. Uh, NLP, natural language processing, is is different. And typically, video is the uh, kind of the trailing uh, industry. It usually starts with image, and then uh, you see the re repercussion or the fruits of that research in in uh, in, in video. In video, we we typically use models. Like we use uh, thresholds. We use heuristics. We use um, we use, we use these models, and these models have been around for quite some time. The problem with these models is they are uh, they, they are not adaptable, and it, video covers a wide spectrum of use cases. And with the COVID, uh, the spectrum got even more <laughs> exponential, and you have all formats. All, all resolutions and even vertical video. Who would believe that vertical video is a thing? Yeah. Apparently, it is today. <laughs> uh, right. So, machine learning came in in the adaptability, making these models we use in, in video compression, making the, make these um, these thresholds, these heuristics adapt to content, adapt to scenarios, adapt to um, use cases. The, the the problem with uh, machine learning and you you, uh, you stated that problem is compute the the deep learning uh, coupled with video compression uh, especially video if you want to do real time processing deep neural network is expensive both on memory on um, on uh, on CPU or a companion GPU or any hardware so so typically. Right now, it's hard to uh, to see these um, deep learn deep neural networks and um, uh, applied to um, to video compression. So mm -hmm. then, that's the hype at the moment. It might change uh, in few years. It might, it might change with the, with the new hardware, uh, with the quantization of the neural network. But what's happening today? What we have today? The reality today is um, we we're using machine learning. Uh, we're using um, classical, I would say, machine learning in things like VMAF. VMAF is, is, is built upon machine learning. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, non-reference metrics are, are, are built upon machine learning, and we and those are running real time. So the, the, the difference, the hype resides in, is it in production? Mm -hmm. Or is still in, uh, uh, or still in uh, in research and academia, and I think the that, that's the fine line between uh, between what we think is usable as of today, because things will, I'm pretty sure things will will evolve uh, in the direction of wider use. Yeah, those are great points. You know, one of the uh, 
questions that I have, and I'm sure our audience does as well, is, is it really just an issue of compute needs to catch up to a point that these algorithms can be run fast enough or efficiently enough? In other words, is, are, are we just waiting for faster processors, you know, more cores, or is there, is there something else that needs to happen? Like, can you, can you explain that a little bit more about what we're really waiting for to be able to <laughs> cross over from, like we said, hype or academia to actual real world use, viable real world use? I can think of two examples. Um, I probably I will take the example of um, deep uh, or deep or uh, deep learning based video compression. So this mm -hmm. this system is end to end. So you encode, so you use machine uh, deep neural network from end to end. the The idea is quite uh, quite simple. Is uh, we're gonna replace. Uh, the entire video compression pipeline with with these uh, uh, compute intensive uh, machine uh, deep neural networks, and the question the question is uh, you have two dimension or probably uh, the, actually they have three dimension. You have the compression efficiency, and you have the uh, uh, you have you have the rate your rate distortion typical, and you have the compute. Mm -hmm. So for for a deep uh, learning based video compression, you have to beat in terms of compression efficiency what we have as classic uh, non machine learning or partial machine learning uh, methods. Mm -hmm. So you expect uh, machine learning based codec to beat uh, the VVC, the AV1. Um, that's that's uh, that's the, the the first target, and you have to beat those codecs by a uh, reasonable margin to justify the compute. If you are at par or below or probably a couple of percent um, better, I don't think it's yeah. viable. Yeah. That's one uh, aspect. So you have, in terms of BD rate, we love to call BD rate. I think the, we always have this discussion with my peers is for for a Deep learning based uh, video codec. How much BD rate you expect that to um, uh, to be to be to uh, to sell it? Mm -hmm. uh, we typically you see in from generation to generation of codec. Like we we, lo we love to say oh fifty percent or thirty three percent, and yeah. and it, uh, there is a debate around that. So I think sure. machine learning based codec has to uh, deliver the thirty three to fifty yeah. percent uh, BD rate improvement. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting. You know, in as you're working with your colleagues, especially those who are uh, really spending time in the scientific community and, and academic, do you think or are you finding that they really factor in at all how deployable um, what they're building is? Or, or do they just sort of... Are they, I don't want to say stuck in because, um, I, I'm not, I'm not saying in a derogatory way, mm -hmm. but you know, let's face it. When you're doing research, you're of a very different mindset. Um, you work for AWS elemental, um, you know, you operate, or at least the platform operates video encoding for some of the largest services in the world. Right. Obviously there's things you would love to do as a <laughs> as a video coding practitioner that you can't because they're not feasible for the reasons you just stated. Do you think the scientific community, the academic community gets that or are they coming around to that or are they still sort of stuck in theory? I think there are two uh, paths of uh, research. So unfortunately the academic research is completely decoupled from the reality of um, of a production deployable. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I think we tend always to forget is uh, we always factor the uh, factor the uh, the compute cost, the hardware cost, but we we kind of forget the training cost. It does cost mm -hmm. money. Uh, so that is always um, and I, I, I always um, like 
go to the uh, CVPR challenges, like the click challenge, the yeah. tier challenge. And nothing like in the training um, is factored in. So you have this beautiful model. If it took sure. two years to, um, it took yeah. two years to, to train, train it. <laughs> I, I think I personally and uh, and my peers wouldn't wait two years to. Uh, no. I, I'm kind of exaggerating, uh, yeah. just to to make. But a your point. but your point stands though. Yeah, exactly. And that's the. I think that research um, is completely decoupled. Um, the other research areas I'm, I'm seeing and where more reasonable uh, effort is the, the effort done by um, in AV2 and uh, in uh, JVET and in mm. and in VC, mm-hmm. and they try to incorporate um, machine learning techniques in in, in the standardization uh, process. Mm-hmm. As of today. I think there are the trials, there are a couple of trials on JVET. JVET has more mileage. Uh, mm-hmm. AV2 is catching up. They, they formed a, a focus group, number four. And the discussion always turns to the point, there are a couple of questions. And I think these, these uh, questions are essential is what to standardize, how to use it, how much compute, and what benefit, uh, like what percentage of bid rate it has to bring. Mm. Um, I think one of the, uh, one of the, in one of the meetings, they, there, was, um, there was this statement from uh, uh, a fella from Google. I, 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 I didn't catch his name. Uh, uh, and they 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 found out that um it, it like a, a small neural network like mobile net v1 uh, mm-hmm. ran with 2 million parameters this is fairly small for mm-hmm. uh, like f- this is nothing compared with the with the typical large sure. um it would take more silicon area than an entire av1 hardware uh, uh decoder <laughs> Like this is a the, the basic unit. Uh, yeah. In terms like I'd, I I like to put uh, uh, like in ter- if you do some classification, mo- sure. mobile uh, net v1 will get you seventy percent, seventy five percent, and that will f- will be equivalent in terms of uh, silicon to mm-hmm. um, to av1. That is the struggle, uh, and that is the limitation and uh, of uh, deep uh, known uh, network being yeah. used in. Uh, on the other hand, there are, uh, like I said earlier, um, you can use still use machine learning, and mm-hmm. uh, even in, in in real time, the way VMAF uh, non reference metric use machine learning is, I think, is the 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 first step to incorporate machine learning in um, in uh, in in video compression. It's uh, I think. Deep neural network will come to video compression one day, mm-hmm. but right now it's hard to uh, I think it's hard to justify and the results like um, the, the just to put again numbers JVET uh, uh, in uh, they did a meeting in um, last month and they found out that with the, some of the tools would get eleven percent and I think that's still still too little for the computer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not enough uh, bang for the buck, you know. I want to talk about VMAF, um, but let's. But we'll circle back around to it. One of the one of the um, ideas that I have, I was going to say theories, but it's not a theory. But is that you know we're marching on this cadence of every uh, well, it used to be ten years uh, that a new video standard would be released. So you think about MPEG two, and then you know, H264, 2003, and then 2013 HEVC. And, you know, actually it compressed a little bit with VVC. Um, But with each new standard is like a 10X or 20X of complexity. And obviously uh, the, the, uh, you know, those that are optimizing the codecs, you know, are, are getting to work very fast. I mean, you look at how quickly AV1 went from being, you know, a laughing stock, you know, like a minute of frame, <laughs> you know, um, to now actually in some settings as fast as X264 uh, and still with bitrate savings, you know, so still with the um, benefits of, of the codec standard. So this is improving. But my question to you is, one of the ideas that I have is that at what point 
do we need to shift our innovation from developing the next standard to developing uh, more efficient machine learning models and and and, and advancing uh, you know deep neural networks to get that increased efficiency from the existing standards. And the obvious advantage that I, because I live largely in the world of, uh, well, largely exclusively, um, I'm working with companies and, and, and around platforms and services that are delivering content to millions and tens of millions, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of users. And, and so you always have to think about, you know, how big is my playback ecosystem? Do my customers have devices that can even support this, you know, this new format, this new standard. And it seems to me that we're at a place now where, um, you know, now HEVC is becoming almost ubiquitous, um, very quickly anyway. And especially with the upgrade cycles of, of, um, at least in, in, um, North America and I think Europe and many parts of the world, you know, people are on a, uh, on a current generation iPhone or maybe just a one or two old generation, which all support HEVC. Do we really need to move, you know, to VVC or some other standard, or should we be investing just as an example in more efficient ways to, you know, to squeeze bits out of HEVC? And this is my question to you. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on this, if you thought about this very same thing, because it has the advantage that if I use machine learning, it still is an HEVC compliant bit stream. It's just 30% smaller, you know, or, or some percent smaller. I think that uh, relates to the effort that uh, I, with my team, spent for the last three years. And one of the questions we always had is um, how to use machine learning as a, as, a, as a powerful tool and also trying to solve problems that our customers are, are facing and and the question is should we move to uh should move to new codec or should we stay on the same codec i'll answer it like like this there are features in any codec that you have to build you have mm-hmm. to build rate control no matter you you have right. mpeg2 vvc you have to build rate control yeah. so if your rate control is not accurate is not robust um I think it's not ready for 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 uh, for uh, 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 the real world. It's not ready for prime time. Mm-hmm. So instead of I think instead of um, thinking about there are building blocks inside the encoder, no matter what codec, it, could, it has to be or could be codec uh, agnostic. So what 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 I did in um, three years ago and is we have rate control, and instead of having versions of rate control for MPEG two for VVC, HEVC, you name it. Let's unify it. Let's use mm. this powerful tool that can predict in the future. And it was not free lunch, trust me. Like uh, it took months trying to figure That's out. Right. Uh, but w- w- there are a lot of lessons learned uh, there. So I think one of the lessons, uh, one of the lessons that, uh, learned in in this uh, in this effort, first of all knowledge in in the machine learning you have to understand how these models work you have to understand uh that is the first lesson second lesson is design mm-hmm. um driving a sports car does not make you a great driver you have to learn how to drive yeah um so that's the second uh second second lesson and i think when you keep in mind that this um model has to run real time it's yes. part of the design it's not a requirement ad hoc. Yeah. So to answer your question, I think um, having a new codec is is great. It, it probably is future proofing our industry. But we have questions, even with MPEG2, we have questions of rate control, mm-hmm. a, ABR, uh, a lot of a lot of interesting uh, a, a lot of interesting question, motion search, uh, adaptive mm-hmm. quantization, perceptual optimization. All these um, themes could leverage from uh, from machine learning, and I think mm-hmm. it has to be the effort of research has to 
go in parallel with uh, with the with the future codec. Future codec, I think, it's it's essential that we might need like we needed the HEVC when we moved to HDR and uh, 4K. We we That's might need the AV2 uh, in five ten years. So, but at this point. People are watching Super Bowl, so people want to watch Super Bowl in 4K, and we need to solve that. And nobody will will wait or like the uh, the streaming when the quality drops. Yeah. Uh, nobody likes that, so we need yeah. to solve these problems. And like I said, some components are codec agnostic, and uh, yeah. you have to address that no matter how advanced the codec is. Yeah, interesting. And. You touch on this, uh, but, you know, I think it's worth even highlighting a bit further is, is that the answer, <laughs> I, this is my most favorite, you know, anyone who knows me knows that I, you know, um, it, it's a little bit of a joking uh, statement, but it's very true. You know, whenever a video practitioner is asked a question, the answer always is safe to say, it depends. <laughs> what are you trying to do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, the, the, the point though here in all seriousness is that, you know, what you point out is that there is an application element. So, uh, you know, are we talking about a live encoding workflow? You know, is this a, um, uh, just earlier today, I, uh, interviewed someone and we were talking only about web RTC, you know, about RTC applications. And we were talking specifically about how the, the, the way that you think about optimizing an encoder and, and making coding optimization decisions in, in RTC is very different than for VOD. So, so that's, uh, you know, one of the points to, to highlight there now, uh, elemental, I believe in all of your encoders uh, supports a QBR function, right? Which is sort of a content adaptive. Uh, it, it's QBR. Is that the QVBR? QVBR. That's right. QVBR. Uh, so, can you comment? Are you using machine learning in QVBR? Uh, and can you give any insights uh, into, you know, how that system works? Uh, sounds good. Um... So the idea of QVBR is we identified cases that um, our old rate control was wasting bits. Mm. That's uh, so. And the other, on the, the other hand, we identified that uh, not all content are equal perceptually, mm -hmm. and not all content are, need all those bits, and not some of the contents are not getting enough bits. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes down to uh, predicting the perceptual value or the perceptual importance of um, uh, of that segment or video or uh, or, or group of frames. So mm -hmm. at the heart of it, it's a it's a rate control function. And what's mm -hmm. different from QVBR to CBR to VBR is what are the constraints? But mm -hmm. the modeling <laughs> inside it is still uh, QP uh, versus bits, mm -hmm. and that is based on uh, rate control. Mm -hmm. And based on rate control, so that's a, that's a predictive uh, function, and with a, a feedback loop and all of that. So we did apply um, a lot of machine learning and uh, in in the inside our rate control. So what machine learning brings into the rate control world is the high adaptability to all scenarios, all contents. So what changed from one function to another is retraining um, with the new scenario. Mm -hmm. So that is what we um, what we applied in the QVBR. Uh, but of course, there are some uh, secret sauces <laughs> in there. Sure. But the the global idea is um, the global idea is the perceptually not all content is the same and you have to adapt um, to content. And um, it, this is in the trend of um, the trend of content adaptivity. I think mm -hmm. Elemental is not the only one and uh, we won an Emmy actually for uh, for for this and with uh, with many many uh, other fellows uh, and uh, I'm so happy to see uh, my fellow uh, video compression uh, artist uh, win the, sa uh, the same Emmy. And the idea yeah, is, like awesome. I said, is um, 
you have to adapt to content. And it's a function where you take the perceptual importance and you have yeah. to determine the number of bits. And So now, d- did you uh, create a, a new quality metric or how exactly are you? Because presumably you're controlling the QP at what, the frame level, I guess, or maybe it adjusts. Uh, but you need some way to measure quality so that you're not introducing artifacts uh, or leaving bits on the table. So mm-hmm. what's the I mechanism think, there? I think the quality uh, in definition of quality that are, you can define quality is the point where you see you start seeing artifacts. Mm. Mm-hmm. You can define quality. Uh, so be, and I like to uh, like always the, this uh, this example. Uh, if you have an SD uh, content like a PAL or an NTSC, and you code it M- MPEG two, and you give it eighty meg, you would yeah. it wouldn't see the difference if uh, with the AVC at five meg, it will look the same. Yeah. So the yeah, the the, the, right. the key point is uh, defining where the just noticeable. Um, mm-hmm. difference or distortion. And I think that is the key definition in what uh, what we do. So we tune the model um, in, in a sense to, def- to define what is the uh, viable QP for that particular uh, content. And the, mm-hmm. our adaptivity, and uh, I think we went down to the coefficient level. Yeah. So uh, so we do it on a, on a scene base, of uh, group of frame or gob base frame level base block base and we go even to the to the coefficient level mm-hmm. um Interesting. because we think even within within the same frame uh the content is not the same uh, i mean the sure. perceptual importance like right now we're talking i think the salient part is we are talking the background you can you can steal some bits from here from here yeah, um, yeah. so we applied those um we applied those uh, um, concepts into, into, uh, the QVBR. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, super interesting. And I, I said earlier, I wanted to talk about VMAF, uh, because you specifically pointed out that VMAF is a machine learning based quality metric. And so I'd love for you to talk just a, a little bit more about that. Um, I'm quite certain that all of our listeners are familiar with VMAF uh, and and even use it. But maybe you can share a little bit more about what's really going on under the hood, because I, I wouldn't assume that everyone knows that. So what can you tell us about how so VMAF the- actually works? <clears throat> The idea of VMAF, I think, uh, is you want to fuse or use different metric that model um, different ways to measure quality. Mm-hmm. Um, as an example, for instance, PSNR is an excellent metric to measure fidelity of the signal, but has no perceptual uh, value or, or or importance in, baked in, into a PSNR. So what right. VMAF tries to do is tries to uh, fuse, give some weight to different uh, metrics depending on content. Uh, as an example, um, if you have a highly textured, uh, highly textured video, I think. PSNR will drop quite a bit, and PSNR will not be reliable. So you will mostly give weights to another metric, SSIM or VIF. So the trick of uh, and the uh, the genius part of uh, uh, VMAF is, depending on the content, you give different weights to um, to the metric. And the, the training was done based on. Uh, a human uh, observer given um, a, a mask or so, so that that's uh, a VMAP. So and the the model would try to determine uh, for each frame the weight of each uh, metric, and it it is uh, what's what is interesting in in VMAP, uh, its simplicity uh, that uses under the hood these metrics. Again, it's also it's a shortcoming. 
Uh, mm. So, because it's this the weighted average of these metrics. So if these metrics are not um, quite reliable enough, so VMAF, there would be the weighted average of that. Mm. Interesting. Well, uh, so are robots taking over? <laughs> you know, so so I have I I have to tell you. Um, so Dor Gill, you know, who's the uh, CTO of Beamer, uh, he jokes all the time, you know, that that we're heading into a world where you know um, robots are going to be creating our video and robots are going to be watching the video, <laughs> so the humans can go out and play, you know, <laughs> can go out and enjoy the the sunshine. So anyway, it's uh, it's a fun joke, but. But uh, no, I think it's a really good way to wrap up our our conversation is, um, well, you know, what is what's the future for machine learning? I think we all can agree that, you know, we are a long ways away from these purely machine learning AI based codecs. And I know there's some, you know, I'm aware of a couple of projects that are that are really groundbreaking and very academically stimulating <laughs> but uh when you look at the you know the real practical requirements for deployment they're they're a long ways away <laughs> they're not coming anytime soon but i'm curious from your perspective and you know especially as a very large commercial vendor very important uh encoding supplier you know to the industry you know, what, what's the time horizon? What do you see in the future? What's coming soon and what's still like 10 years out or longer? <laughs> so robots uh, are not taking over. This is my personal uh, That's view. good news. <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion, my humble opinion. Um, I, I, I will quote uh, and I kind of segue to uh, my answer. I'll quote uh, Michael I. Jordan, not the basketball player, the yes. machine learning scientist. Uh, the revolution of machine learning hasn't hasn't happened yet, so it will happen, but not n not yet. So we, like I said, video is kind of the trailing industry compared to image. So what I think we will see in the future um, and is more use of machine learning, but on more on as more focus on the perceptual aspect. Uh, the vision aspect, um, the the coding tools, I think with VVC, AV1 or HEVC, I think we have a solid codex. What's missing there is how to tune those codecs perceptually. Uh, what, what I mean perceptually is if you have film grain, if you have um, graphics, if you have sport content versus, I think there is room there. And we, an uh, element, and I'm pretty sure everybody in the industry uh, is seeing there is potential there. So mm -hmm. the perceptual element is still um, missing, or, or probably missing is uh, uh, probably is is there, but there is there is a large room for improvement. So I think machine learning will shine in that area. I think. 10 years or probably five to 10 years, the deep uh, learning based codec will start to reemerge when they, uh, they, when they solve the pra practical aspects like standardization, what do you send the network? Um, how do you compress the network? And one key, and I shout out to the research community, quantization parameter is the key parameter in any video codec. Start right. with that. Start That's with right. with the QP, and yeah. the, I think that those two letters are the uh, the letters I used most in my last eighteen years. So I think research machine learning has to start with those two parameters, uh, two letters. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more, and I I think that's just an awesome way to end. So wrap up this episode. Well, Ramsey, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you know, this was really, uh, we, we covered a lot in 30 or 35 minutes here. So uh, maybe this is one of those that listeners will have to listen twice to, one of those episodes, but that'll be great. Uh, we'll have you back for sure. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll do a part two or we'll find some other interesting element uh, to talk about, you know, around uh, video uh, compression, video encoding. It's a very fun topic. So, um, yeah, thank you again for coming on the Videoverse. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm.